Now, before we begin, I want to remind you about Chilling, the scary stories app that I'm a narrator on, which will very soon become Chilling 2.0, a full-fledged platform which will include video content in addition to the stories. Full-length horror films, series, and exclusive Chilling originals are just some of what Chilling 2.0 is bringing to horror fans. It's being crafted by horror fans for horror fans. Download now and start your free trial to see if you like it. There are so many popular narrators on Chilling and over a thousand stories, with hours more being added every week. Lastly, Chilling is now accepting investments from the public, and investors are taking notice. You can get in on it now before this opportunity closes. Don't miss out. Chilling is a must-have app for horror story lovers, and Chilling 2.0 will change the game completely. The links to download and check out the investment page are in the description below. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. Did you know that the average smartphone in your pocket, to the computer that you rely on for work, well, all of these use gold, copper, and zinc, and several other minerals to function properly. The average device has more than 35 minerals in it. So basically, we couldn't survive without the mining industry. Not that that would be much comfort to the protagonists in tonight's story. Curse of the Silverhead Mine by Positive Tennis 6626. Part 1 Congratulations, Mr. Marcus, on your new property. The realtor said as she shook my hand, and the sun was setting in the west. Well, thank you, but as I already told you, it's just Mark, I replied. Well, Mark, I still congratulate you on your land purchase. What do you plan on doing with all 200 acres? The realtor asked as she hung the sold sign underneath the for sale sign. Well, build a bunch of luxurious rustic cabins and rent them out as Airbnb for glamping. People eat that crap up. As the realtor left, I looked into the woods and took in a big, deep breath of fresh mountain air. Tomorrow, I said aloud, though no one was around to hear me. Tomorrow, I'll go into town, get some supplies, and do a proper survey of the land. Not just that walk around the realtor gave me. Yeah, tomorrow, but right now, I want a rum and coke. I walked back to my small camper and fired up the generator. The lights inside flickered on in a warm glow and I celebrated my new business venture. It was hard not to. I got this land for a steal. It was way below market value and I'd be remiss if I didn't say I celebrated way too hard. Well, I'm not going to bore you with all the details over the next few months, but the proper paperwork was filed, a building permit acquired and a well was dug. The only real snag was getting the zoning changed. It was zoned for commercial logging and before that for mining. It struck me as odd. Trying to get it zoned for residential use was about as easy as giving an octopus a manicure. I had to pay special fees and fill out mounds of paperwork all while the area where I wanted to build was cleared of trees and vegetation. The building material for three homes just laid around taking up space and work crews stood around all day costing me money. I finally got in front of the zoning board and pleaded my case, explaining how it would bring tourists into the town and local businesses would get a boost in sales. I was denied a zoning change. From there, it was playing the small town politics game. Greasing some pockets, a very expensive bottle of whiskey showed up on the mayor's desk. The president of the zoning board was suddenly able to afford that new pickup truck he wanted. Eh, you get the idea. The town was in an uproar when it got approved. Things started going missing at the construction site and heavy equipment was damaged. The chief of police got a new pool and then all the issues stopped. First house was completed except for the solar panels that needed to be installed. The walls were going up on the second house and the concrete foundation was being poured for the third. I had a survey crew out looking for a new location. It was early in the morning and I poured a cup of hot fresh coffee into my travel muck and was just about to go and inspect the work sites. I knew nothing about construction. I just wanted to make sure the crews weren't slacking off. Then there was a knock on my trailer door. Hey boss, you in there? A voice said. I opened up the door to see Sam, survey foreman, at the door. Uh, 
What do you want, Sam? I asked, with just a little irritation in my voice. Boss, we found something you should probably see, Sam said. I stepped out of my trailer and was following Sam. He was going on about something, but I just tuned him out while we walked, and I took sips of coffee from my travel mug. I let the warm, caffeinated drink work its magic on me, and we walked for a while through the woods till we came to the edge of a cliff, looking down into a small valley. Sam started back up. See, boss, me and the boys were out looking for a good spot to put the new houses you want up. We thought this would have a nice view of the land, and then we spotted that down there. I looked to where Sam was pointing, and to my shock, there was what appeared to be a big, single-story log cabin that looked almost like a rectangle. Behind it were four smaller rectangular cabins spaced evenly apart from each other, and almost equidistant from the main cabin in the middle. Each of the smaller cabins had what seemed to be a small wooden shed off to the left, and another small shed behind them. Off to the left and set further back was a two-story cabin. To the right, about 300 yards away, was a giant metal tower with exposed beams and support legs with metal lattice working all throughout, about 100 feet high, with two giant wheels that adorn the top with cables running to a smaller building behind it. This is all on my land? I asked. Sam replied with, Yes, it barely is, but technically yes. You might have some issues with the mine tunnels. What? I stammered. That's a mine? The realtor never mentioned a mine on the property. She said this land was used for logging. There is a logging camp, though well, I never found it. I asked some of the guys in the crew about that, replied Sam. My dad was a miner. I remember visiting him at work and seeing the same hulk in tower. Now Steve, the new guy on my team, he was a logger and explained that the big log cabin in the middle was the cook's shanty where everyone ate. The buildings behind them were the bunk houses where everyone slept. Finally, the little sheds behind the bunk rooms were most likely the outhouses. My best guess is that the mine came first and then the logging camp, Sam said. I shook my head and replied, Makes no sense to me. Let's go down there for a better look. We made our way down to the logging camp. Well, this is kind of cool. Never done any exploring like this before, I thought to myself. As we walked through the camp and up to the big tower, ideas were racing through my head. Man, I could turn this into a hunting lodge, or market the bunk rooms as eco-friendly lodging. Hippies love that crap. <laughs> I'm going to be so freaking rich. Hey boss, what do you make of this? I looked at where Sam was pointing. There were small scratch marks all along the tower. They weren't deep marks that marred the metal, but surface scratches as if someone was crawling around. Bears? Maybe a mountain lion? I surmised. Yeah, maybe, but the marks go up 50 feet. What would a mountain lion been doing up there? More importantly, how would it get up there to begin with? Sam asked. A plaque next to the elevator read, Silver Head Mine. Hey, this used to be a silver mine, I said out loud. The elevator appeared to be in decent shape from what I could see. The hole leading down into the mine had two massive sliding iron doors on tracks covering it. Hey boss, you want me to have the guys open it up? Sam asked as he walked to one side and gripped the handles on the door. Uh, no, uh, let's wait to do that. If the people before us sealed it with the doors, they must have had a good reason. Let's go check out the other building, I replied. The inside of the bunk room seemed to be in rough shape with mold on the wood, and the bunk bed frames rusted out. The cook shanty had a lock on the door, but after giving it one good whack with a crowbar, the old lock fell right off. The inside of the cook shanty was in immaculate condition. Inside was a large open room with three tables and bench seating, all made out of solid oak. The walls had a few deep scratches on them, as if some sort of animal had gotten in. Two wooden doors led to the back, where the kitchen had cast iron ovens and stoves, all wood burning. I was amazed to discover there was no rust and no ash. There wasn't even a squeak when I opened the oven door. Shelves that lined the back side of the kitchen were where the dry goods would have been stored. The two-story cabin turned out to be the mine boss's office and lounge. The first floor had a beautiful stone fireplace, 
A smooth, hand-carved desk, a mounted deer head hung above the fireplace, and a painted portrait hung behind the desk. It portrayed a family of three, the father in a top hat, suit, and a cloak, his wife on his left side wearing a bright yellow dress, and an older daughter in the middle wearing a light green dress. Behind them, on top of a hill, sat a three-story Victorian manor house. On the bottom of the painting, a small bronze plaque was mounted to the frame which read, The Ravenswood Family. The upstairs of the cabin had a small bar and a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling. Hey Sam, does this place have power? I asked. Well boss, I've seen junction boxes outside all the structures, but don't know if it's hooked up to the grid, Sam replied from the first floor of the cabin. I pulled the chain on the light, but nothing happened. Like an idiot, I pulled the chain a few more times as if I was expecting something to happen. I walked down the wooden staircase to the first floor and spotted Sam looking at something next to the door. Oh, what are you looking at, Sam? I asked. Oh, the telephone's an old one. It even says Bell Telephone Company on the side of it, Sam says. And there were, in fact, two telephones. One was black and the other was a dull yellow with black spots where the paint had chipped away from it. I reached for the yellow phone and picked it up. Nothing. I put the phone back on the receiver and tried the black phone. To my surprise, I got an old-fashioned dial tone, as if the phone was still hooked up to the phone line. I looked at Sam and said, Well, let me try to call my cell phone. The phone had a rotary wheel just like my grandparents had had. It took me a minute to remember how to dial out. The line rang once, and I got my cell phone's voicemail. Well, I was lucky to get one bar of service out here. Any time I had to make a phone call for any reason, I had to drive into town where I could get a good signal. Hmm, maybe an underground phone line, I thought to myself. Well, the phone works, which is kind of weird, but hey, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, I said. Sam and I left the cabin and made our way over to the metal shack that held the mine elevator system. Big thick cables on massive steel drums took up most of the room. A big green engine that said Cummins on the side took up the remaining space. Well, boss, there's your power. Big ass generator. Shoot, that thing looks like it's from the 70s. I wonder if it even runs, Sam said to me. Well, this is a lot to take in, Sam. I'm going to walk around the property. Why don't you and your boys get back to work? Hey, look, I appreciate you letting me know about all this, I said to him. And Sam replied, yeah, sure thing, boss. I spent the rest of the day exploring the buildings in the mine elevator. I looked at the two massive iron doors covering the mine with a heavy-duty lock and chain wrapped around the handles. Both the lock and chain were rusted to hell and back. There was about a three-inch gap between the doors, but it looked like the doors could be opened about six or seven inches before the chain would be good and tight. I gave the door a tug, but it wouldn't budge. <sighs> rusted shut. I have to get some PB blaster and some WD-40 to unstick that later, I thought. I spent the rest of the day looking around and making a list of everything I'd need to get this place back in shape. The next day, when the electrician showed up to install the solar panels, I had him look at the logging camp instead. After testing the connection, junction boxes and fuse boxes on all the buildings in the logging camp, he said, Well, it's all hooked up and working properly. It's older wiring, but most of it's underground, so the risk of a fire due to a short circuit's minimal. That eh, should work once the generator's turned on. That looks to be in great shape. I don't know about all the liquids inside, oil, coolant, diesel, fuel, and so on. If they've been sitting there a while, your liquids could be solids by now. i got a buddy of mine who does diesel engines. Why don't you give him a call? Well, I did call, and he came out right away. He replaced all the fluids, and we fired up the generator. It belched black smoke twice, and then growled to life. I took a step outside and saw the lights come on. The mine elevator tower's sodium floodlights came on and cast everything in eerie orange-yellow shadows. The light stretched all the way up to the tree line of the forest. A warm glow came from the cabin windows. In the cook shanty, a light came from under the main double doors. The diesel mechanic explained to me that there's enough fuel in the internal tank for about 72 hours under a workload. The mechanic then showed me how to operate the generator and what all the gauges and buttons do. 
As the sun set, I took a deep breath of the north woods air, while the sound of the generator hummed from inside the metal elevator shack. I walked back to shut down the generator, and walked out of the elevator shack towards my truck. I was about 50 feet away from the mine, when I heard a loud bang. I spun around and looked in the direction of the mine and heard another loud bang, followed by the sounds of chains bouncing off iron. The sun was below the tree line, but not quite to the horizon. It almost looked like something had slammed against the doors of the mine shaft. I saw what looked like rust shaking loose and floating into the air like an orange-colored dust storm. I walked up to the edge of the doors, right in the middle, and shone my cell phone's flashlight into the gap between the doors. I held the phone down low just above the doors. I saw a quick flash of white move across the gap. Well, the movement startled me, and I jumped back, dropping my phone. Luckily, it didn't fall through the gap in the doors, but instead bounced off the iron door with a thud and landed on the gravel next to it. When I bent down to pick up my phone, I heard a soft hissing of a rattle emanating from the mine. I quickly grabbed my phone and walked away while mumbling to myself. Well, that has to be a bat. A really, really big-ass bat to move a door like that. And a dumb bat to hit the door. Yeah, just a bat. What else could it be? Nothing, that's what. God, I need a drink. Time to hit the bar. Then got in my truck and drove towards downtown. Monday morning came around and I awoke to the sounds of birds chirping and squirrels playing in the forest. What I didn't hear was the sound of construction workers working and heavy machinery moving. I quickly threw on pants and a t-shirt. My head was still pounding from the weekend's drinking bender, and I had to concentrate more than I would like to admit from keeping what was left in my stomach from coming up. I opened up the door to my trailer and saw that no one was around all the equipment and building material. There were just no people. I checked my phone. No calls, but then again no service as well. I drove into town and stopped at a small mom-and-pop diner for breakfast. As soon as I got into town and had cell phone service, the phone exploded with texts and missed calls. There were over 24 of them. A lot of the missed calls were from the construction men saying my checks had bounced. I checked my account and was shocked to see that almost all my money was gone. My crypto investment went belly up over the weekend, leaving me with hardly any money. All construction on the house had come to a stop. Oh, stupid, stupid, I thought. Why did I have the electrician look at that damn logging camp instead of installing the solar panels? I could have at least gotten people to stay here. No panels means no power. No power means no well pump. Without a well pump, I won't have toilets or showers. Stupid, stupid. I thought all these things while banging my head against the steering wheel of my truck. I spent the next three days and what little money I had drinking my problems away at the local bar. Corgi's McShorty's Irish Pub. Why is there a Corgi-themed Irish pub way up in the North Woods? <laughs> Who knows? I was sipping on my second glass of whiskey. The amber liquid was doing its best to help me forget my woes. I overheard a group of people talking and laughing. They're on their way out of the pub when I heard one of them say, Well, we better turn in if we want to get to the cave early tomorrow. I downed the remainder of my drink and ran after the group. I caught them in the parking lot. Hey, uh, wait, uh, hold up. You guys said something about cave exploring? I asked. In front of me was a group of five in about their mid-twenties. A woman stepped towards me. She was about five-nine, athletic build, with the words CrossFit running down the length of her yoga pants. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, and very perky assets. She stuck out her hand and said, Hey, I'm Samantha, and this ball of sunshine next to me is Jessica. Jessica was about the same height as Samantha. She wore baggy jeans and an oversized black hoodie. Her jet black hair hung just past her shoulders. She had the most intense green eyes, and there was a look of suspicion on her face when I approached. It was obvious that Jessica had stepped in to stop Samantha from making dumb decisions more than once. But Samantha continued. Tall guy in the back's Eric B. We call him Burns. Burns was in fact tall, over six feet. He just got out of the army only seven months previous. 
He was built like a house, but since his time out, you could just start to see a small amount of fat forming over his physique. Samantha finally finished with, and those two lovebirds in the back are Josh and Dakota. Josh was an average person with very few defining features, the kind of person who can walk into a room and just hide in plain sight. Dakota was just a head smaller than the rest, with long blonde hair, her clothes were worn out and the faded colours gave off the sense of someone whose family didn't come from money. And yes, we are cave explorers, Samantha said with a matter-of-fact tone. Spelunkin. It's called Spelunkin, Burns said from the back. Oh right, yeah, thank you, Burns. Yes, we're amateur Spelunkers. Why do you ask? replied Samantha. Well, I have a cave on my property. Well, it's a mine. A silverhead mine. The mine shaft is closed, but I'm about to open up tours. I'd love to have someone who knows what they're doing have a peek down there first, I explained. And everyone in the group looked excited, except for Jessica, who looked skeptical. How much? Samantha asked. Oh, crap, I thought. They want to get paid for this, don't they? Well, there goes your free explorers. I was about to open my mouth with a response when Samantha said again, how much does it cost to go into the mine? It's around $300 just to get a climbing permit to explore the caves around the national park. Oh, um, uh, $200, I blurted out without thinking about it. Okay, sold, Samantha said, and continued with, Well, we're exploring some caves today, and we'll be back in two weeks. Can we do half now and half later? Mm, absolutely, I said with a bit too much enthusiasm. The group started reaching into their pockets and purses for the cash. All but Jessica and Dakota, that is. Jessica just crossed her arms with a serious look on her face, and Dakota just kind of fidgeted with a look of sadness. Dakota then whispered something into Josh's ear. Jessica spoke out. Okay, everyone, can we all just chill out for one minute? We don't know this person, and you guys are ready just to hand him money. Look, we need your name and an address. Just how safe is this mine? My name's Mark. I can write down the address, and you're more than welcome to check out the mine before you leave this weekend. There's an elevator to get down. Now, to be honest with everyone, I don't know if it works. We can always rappel down the shaft. I used to rock climb, so I have the rope for it. I'll be going with you, of course, and if it makes you feel better, we can do half of the payment now and half later. Satisfied with this answer, even Jessica couldn't hold back a smile. Well, these kids love action and adventure, not to mention they'd be the first to explore the mine in who knows how many years. Everyone gave me a hundred bucks. I gave them the address, shook everyone's hand, and happily walked back into the park. Part 2 When I sat down at the bar, I noticed my glass was full. I was about to tell the bartender I didn't order a drink when the man next to me smoked. Did I hear correctly that you're reopening the Silverhead Mine? Yes, I am, I said, very proud of the fact that I was. You know that uh, that mine is cursed, the man said. I blew air out of my nostrils and replied with, oh, There are no such thing as curses. The man slammed his drink down on the bar in anger and frustration. Any man worth their salt in this area knows the story of the Silverhead Mine. But you're not from around here, are you? Before I could even begin to reply to this man sitting next to me, he began the story. All oh, started back in 1869. I chuckled in my own head and thought, 69, nice. A man by the name of George Ravenswood started that mine. The mine went down deep till it struck silver. Oh, things were good for a few years. Silver was flowing out of that mine like water from a tap. Now George, his wife, and his only daughter Melanie were very rich, and so was the town. Yeah, life was good for everyone. One day the miners were digging out a huge deposit of silver, the biggest one they found yet. They dug this huge cavern in the shape of a dome, about six football fields long, about four football fields high at the biggest points. Well, there was a cave-in. Fortunately, everyone got out alive, but 
The size of the caving caused the surface above to sink into the ground. Shortly after that, a Native American chief and the tribe's shaman approached George, told him that the ground collapsed due to the fact that the mine was the site of that tribe's burial grounds. Well, they asked George to stop digging in that area and to leave their ancestors' bones to rest. But Henry, in his greed, refused to stop digging, so there was a lot more silver to dig in that spot. Well, the shaman cursed the mine and the Ravenwood family. He placed the curse of the Wirewalks. The Native Americans believed that the Wirewalks were demons from the afterlife, said to suck the soul out of any man, woman, or child at night, and only the spirit of the sun god could stop them. And George just laughed at all this. The collapse caused the delay and he lost profits. As a result, he ordered the mine to be open 24 hours a day. As the day shift crew started to work, a powerful earthquake struck and trapped 18 miners in the cavern they were clearing out. The rest of the day crew did their best to rescue the trap man. When the sun dipped below the horizon, a shrieking sound could be heard coming from the area of the trap miners, followed by the sound of men calling out for help in pain and terror. And then, suddenly, the cry stopped. It took the rescue party almost another 12 hours to reach the trap miners. All that was found were the shriveled up dry husks of the men. Their dark skin stretched tight over the bones, with a look of anguish on each one of their faces. The bodies were brought up to the surface for the town doctor to look at. Well, the bodies weighed no more than just a few pounds. When the first body was cut open for an exam, they found all the organs, blood, and even the bone marrow was gone, leaving only the hollow bones on the inside. George gave the men one hour to grieve, then sent them back into the mine to dig. While the sun was up, all was peaceful in the mine, and work was normal. When the sun was setting, the men came up, and the night shift went down. And that's when everything changed. Twenty-eight men went down into the Silverhead mine, but only four made it back to the elevator and rode it up to the surface. There, they spent the night cowering in fear as the wirewalks crawled all over the elevator tower, trying to get at the men. When dawn was approaching, the wirewalks crawled back into the cave. It wasn't until the sun was up in the sky that the men left the safety of the elevator and ran into town to alert everyone. The wirewalks were described to the town folks as the lower half of a praying mantis and the upper half of a man. A man with no face, just a wide mouth and no eyes. They had small slits for a nose, bat-like ears, all pale, almost translucent white skin, with a large tail and a snake rattle at the end that drags along the ground. It has long, rail-thin arms with hands double the size of any normal man. And their hiss is like that of an angry cat hissing at an intruder. The man said that the wire walks attacked the workers, and that they only made it out because they were only a few steps from the elevator. Well, when George heard all this, his blood began to boil. He gathered a dozen of the best shooters and hunters in town and formed a posse. Then they all went down into the mine just before sundown. Some of the town folks gathered outside the mine as well. As the sun set, intense gunfire could be heard from the inside of the mine. And then there was silence. They came crawling out of the darkness of the mine shaft like ants out of a nest attacking anyone on the surface. Well, a few of the day shift miners and some town folk hid inside the cook shanty, staying quiet and out of sight as they watched the Wirewalk suck the soul out of each and every man. They saw the concentrated fire from six men armed with lever-action repeating rifles take one of the Wirewalks down before they themselves were overrun and taken down. In the morning, the survivors warned the surrounding towns. When all the towns came together, pooling their resources, and built two heavy iron doors to seal the mine shut. George Ravenwood's wife was struck with grief over the loss of her husband. She died a few days later from a broken heart. The mine was closed till 1972 when a father and son bought the land and began to modernize the place to reopen. They took out the steam generator and put a modern one in and hooked up lights and electricity to the mine and all the buildings. Before they could finish and open up the mine for mining, they went missing. Some say it was a lizard monster with purple eyes, but who knows? I began to slow clap. 
Wow, bravo, that's a very good story, I said in a sarcastic tone. A question for you though, if this is true then what happened to Melanie? Someone from that family must still be alive. Well, the man replied with, Melanie became known as the Black Widow Bride. Some say it was the Native American curse stopping her from marrying, or the phantom of Henry Ravenwood himself making sure no one got his wealth. Every person Melanie married ended up dead just a few days after the wedding. The Ravenwood Manor sits on top of the big hill, far away from here, dilapidated and abandoned. As for Melanie, she was run out of town. Last anyone heard, she changed her name to Constance and moved to New Orleans, but I bet the curse still followed her. Well, I guess my property is kind of not normal then, I said. The man replied with, No, there's this guy named Cole. Lives about ten miles from you. That guy's property isn't normal. Well... As much as I'd love to hear that story, I said as I stood up. I'm going to take my 500 bucks, go buy a bottle of Jack, and party back at my place. In a week or so, I will open that mine. As I was walking out, the man shouted to me, Hey, Mark. Now this froze me mid-step, as I'd never given him my name. I turned and croaked out, y Yeah? The man took a shot of alcohol and said to me, Wealth doesn't make you a successful man. It's what a man does with his wealth that defines him. Now greed, on the other hand, the need to be wealthy can make you make bad decisions. Decisions that can cause death and not necessarily your own. You do your best to heed my advice and not open that mind. I began walking back to my camper on my property. I stopped at the local liquor store and got a bottle of Jack and took long pulls from it as I walked. It took me over an hour to get home. Well, normally it's a 30 minute walk. Well, the difference tonight was staggering. Half the bottle got drained when I stumbled back towards the mine. Well, I walked on to the iron doors and just as the sun began to set I started jumping and stomping on them. I began to shout out loud in my inebriated state. Uh, Wirewalks. Come here, Wirewalks. <laughs> I fell onto the doors, drunkenly laughing, my bottle of Jack landing next to the small crack between the doors. I bent down to grab it, muttering, Ah, oh, damn, spilled my booze. I could just make out the faint sound of scratching like two rocks rubbing together, when out of the darkness of the mine two bony, pale hands reached between the crack of the door and tried to force the doors open. The chain and lock clanged, and they went taut. The door slid about six inches open with such force that in my drunkenness I stumbled off of them and onto the ground. I sat up and saw the two white, almost translucent hands grab the bottle of Jack and pull it into the mine. Hey, it's mine. Yay. I put my hands up like an old-timey boxer from the 1920s. Yeah, I'll fight you. Yeah, I'll fight you for it. Come here, you wee orcs. That was the last thing I said before I fell back down and passed out. I woke up to the sun high overhead. My mouth was dry as if I'd been eating cotton balls all night. My head was pounding like it had its own heartbeat. My arms, legs and face were so sunburned that I matched the colour of a lobster. I rolled over onto my stomach and got on all fours and proceeded to vomit up the contents of my stomach. When I expelled the last of my wings and whiskey from last night, I spit out the last of that thick abomination. I got up and staggered over to my trailer, which I had moved closer to the logging camp some time ago. I walked inside, grabbed a bottle of water, and greedily chugged it down. I made that lip-smacking ah sound in satisfaction, then promptly opened up the trailer door and vomited up the water and stomach acid concoction, the colour closely resembling chicken noodle soup broth. I spent the next few hours lying on my bed sipping water mixed with hangover powder. Any time I picked my head up more than a few inches from my pillow, it would feel like my brain was trying to force its way out of my skull. When the throbbing in my head got down to a more tolerable level, I started looking up numbers of mines to call to see if I could get anyone out here to look at the elevator and get it working. 
I used the landline phone in the cabin and called well over a dozen mines. Most places said sure, but when I told them it was the elevator at the old Silverhead mine, most of them quickly changed their answer to no. Some just laughed, and two even hung up on me. But I finally got a hold of someone who would look at the elevator. They said they'd do small commercial elevators, but would give it a look over. They mentioned that it wouldn't be for a few days, though. So I spent the next couple of days cleaning up the logging camp, trying to make it look as presentable as possible, and thinking about what I'd seen. That old man's story resounded in my mind. And I finally convinced myself that in my state of drunkenness, I'd imagined the doors moving and I just slipped and fell due to the fact I was drunk. As for the old man's warning, he was just trying to scare me with some urban legend. I doused the rollers and tracks the iron door sat on with WD-40 till the squeaking stopped and the doors rolled freely. The last thing to do was to cut the chain off the door, but I was still hesitant to do so. The day before the elevator maintenance tech was going to show, I called my buddy who's a lawyer and had him write up a legal waiver for someone who'd go into the mine to sign. This was basically stating that no one could sue me if anything bad happened. I also had him put a section in there about no one being allowed in the mine after sunset, which he thought was weird, but didn't argue. After he emailed it to me, he asked me a question that I didn't know the answer to. He asked how deep the mine is. I said I didn't know, but I think I would know how I was going to find out. I went to the construction side of the houses that I wanted to build. I grabbed two cinder blocks, a wooden rod, and 2,000 yards of rope on a spool. It was the yellow plastic kind that everyone just seemed to have, but no one can remember buying. I fired at the mine generator as it was getting close to sundown. Man, I thought to myself, I really need to do this kind of crap during the day. I set up the cinder blocks parallel to each other. I put the wooden rod through the spool of rope, and then put both ends of the wooden rod in the hole of each cinder block. It sort of resembled the winch on the front of a truck. I took a one-pound kettlebell and tied it to the rope. Before I dropped it, I looked down the shaft and saw that there were lights on inside. Ah, well, the old man was telling the truth. They did put lights in the mine. Even with the lights, it was still too far down to see the bottom. I took a pull from my bottle of vodka and pushed the kettlebell down the opening in the door. In no time, it hit terminal velocity and I used my shoe to slow it to a stop. Realizing that I couldn't just let this thing freefall, I had one hand on the spool and the other on the vodka bottle, and I slowly lowered the weight down the shaft and took pulls from the bottle at the same time. All of a sudden, the rope went slack. I pulled some rope up and released it a few times to make sure it wasn't hung up on something. A slight clang, clang, clang could be heard after I'd released the rope. Satisfied it was at the bottom of the shaft, I looked around for something to mark that section of rope. My thinking was that I could measure how deep the mine is, and this would allow me to make sure the mine wasn't flooded. I cursed my stupidity when I realized that I'd left the marker in the trailer. I took a couple of steps away from the spool, when it started to move. It was slow at first, then got faster and faster, and then bam, it was off to the races. The rope was now spooling out a lot faster than when it was going in freefall. Smoke started to come out of the end of the spool as friction between it and the rod was enough to burn the wood. The rope reached the end of the spool and went tight with a twang that echoed through the shaft. Wood smoke hung faintly in the air, followed by a cracking sound when the wooden rod snapped into two. The spool, now empty of its rope, except the end that was secured to the spool itself, clanged off the iron doors. And then came a sight that freaked me out. The spool began to slide to the left, all the way to the end of the doors, and then all the way to the right, as if some unseen force was sliding it around. The rope broke with a loud bang. I ran to push the doors closed. Closing what little gap between the doors there was, I stared at the two massive iron doors. I looked at the remaining vodka in the bottle and took one very long pull from it, letting the clear, harsh liquid do its thing. I began walking back and forth, trying to figure out what had happened. Oh, think, think, I said out loud. It had to be a rock slide. 
Yeah, that's it. Some rock must have fallen off the side of the shaft, got entangled in the rope and pulled it down. Yeah, yeah, that's it. When the rock got caught, it caused the rope to swing to the side. Snap my fingers, then. That's it. <laughs> Ain't no wild walks. It's all in your head. I said to myself and took another swig of vodka. Oh, man. Maybe I can mug this creepy story for Halloween. I can see the sign now. Come one, come all, to the cursed Silverhead Mine. Scary tour available every weekend in October. Well, cheers to me, I said, and raised the bottle of vodka in the air and downed the rest of it. The next day, as I was nursing what little hangover I had, the elevator tech showed up. I walked him over to the small elevator shack next to the big metal tower. He looked around and got to work. He came out a few hours later looking very dirty and said, Well, I greased the baron and the cable. They're in very good shape. The hydraulic brakes and the hoses look worse, though. Those will need to be replaced within a year or two. He walked me into the control room and showed me a lever that said up and down, and a red button that said emergency stop. He pulled on the down lever and the generator, which was already on, growled a little louder under the load. With a whining noise, the elevator moved down and made a loud clang against the iron doors. The elevator tech moved the lever to up, and the elevator moved up. The tech explained how it all works, and I'm not going to explain it all. The short story is that the elevator runs on a track that goes all the way down, and there are two ways to operate this elevator. The buttons on the side of the override controls. When activated, the override controls located in the elevator shack override the controls in the elevator itself. There's also a big hydraulic brake similar to a car's disc brakes, but on a much bigger scale. The gravity brakes, the two metal balls attached to a spinning shaft that, when spun too fast, gets expanded out and activates the brakes. The tech told me this was the part that was missing. When I looked at the big spool of cable, it read a thousand yards on the side. Hey, uh, is there really a thousand yards of cable on this? I asked the tech. Well, the tech responded with, well, no. This caused me to relax. And the tech went on. That's probably like a thousand yards plus three to five yards of extra cable to account for shrinking and expanding in cold and heat. The tech wished me farewell and left me with the thought of how two thousand yards of rope could possibly all be used up on a hole in the ground no more than a thousand yards deep. I drown my confusion in a bottle of coconut rum and stumble my way into the old mining boss's cabin, and then staggered my way up the stairs and passed out in the chair. I woke up to darkness surrounding the cabin on all sides, and the crackling glow of fire coming from the ground floor. I slowly rose from my seat and heard the ring of a telephone from below me. I quietly made my way down the steps and heard a voice yelling, I don't care how many men it takes to clear that cave in, Get it done and keep digging. I could see the back of a man. He was wearing a cloak and a top hat. He slammed the yellow phone down on the receiver and then turned to look at me. His face was just a bleached white skull. As his dark eye holes looked up at me, he let out a hellish laugh and then flew towards me. So, my dear friends, what do you think of this one? It's uh, heating up pretty nicely, isn't it? Yeah, well, we're going to see next Friday night. I think, yeah, definitely next Friday, how this ends up. That is parts one and two of a four-part story, and it's going to be about two hours altogether. So, thank you very much for listening to parts one and two. I'll probably put all four of them together in one video for next Friday. I know you kind of like it when I do that. It seems to be the way that you <laughs> favor things. I don't know. What the hell am I talking about? You know, yeah, so I um, wanted to get that all done for yesterday, but I don't know, the voice wasn't up to it, unfortunately. But yeah, I really like this story, how it's heading. Um, well, we'll see. Let's see if those um, young'uns turn up for part three, eh? Don't like what is in store for them, to be honest, but well, we'll see. 
Okay, my dear friends, well, once again, thank you for joining me on this Saturday evening. Um, more of the meat locusts coming along tomorrow. Yeah, it's been a, taking a bit longer than I wanted to finish that off, but it's uh, getting there, definitely. So that's coming tomorrow night. And anyway, enough of this waffling. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.